Gospels. And uh, John 17. And just so, uh, so you know, I want to uh, share that for me and uh, my years, it's been a joy to be here and a joy to be your pastor. And uh, I take it as a great privilege that the Lord granted me this opportunity. John uh, chapter 17 and verse 15. Verse 15. Okay, you can stand up now. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. You may be seated. DIY. You're probably familiar with that acronym that's been used today. It's very popular, and it's a term that's used to refer to projects that people are doing that normally you would pay someone else to do, right? Do it yourself. DIY. And uh, so you want to save money? You want to get something done? You want to do it yourself? Uh, the most common projects are home projects that we do because when you own a home and you have a home, things break, right? Things stop working after a period of time. So homeowners can be found online searching and into the search engines looking for articles or looking for videos explaining how to do these projects themselves. YouTube is amazing. And I've used it many, many, many times as I wanted to fix something in the home. How to paint a room, how to lay tile in the bathroom, install a faucet, what to do with that, what I needed to buy at the store, all kinds of projects, plumb a new bathroom even. So remove a wall from your home. Uh, tune a lawnmower. I've, I've not done all these, but I've done some of these things. And the process is always conveyed in a few simple steps. <laughs> a few simple steps. How to install a water line. How to repair your home's foundation. You know, jack the home up and you know, take care of it yourself. Simple. <laughs> simple stuff. And uh, the first step is always never... Call a professional. You can do this. Never call a professional. Now, I'm smarter than that. I've, I've called, I've had Gary over the house working on something, and I've had Dan Woods over there. And I've talked to Mike White about some things, and, and Dennis, here, you know, there's some things. And when I really want someone professional, I get hold of Andy, and, uh, and we're off, and we're going, you know. But there are problems that arise, right? There are problems. In a recent article that I was looking at that was talking about DIY and home improvements, says that, and I think this number is really, really low, that 43% of homeowners say they've messed up their projects. Do you think that's low? I think that's low, 43%. I mean, I, I make up 10%. 43%. This week... What we want to talk about in being holy, how to be holy, and being holy, we're talking about the how. And my concern is that it may suggest to us that our holiness is another DIY project. Allow me to say from the get-go, you can't do this. You can't do this on your own. Holiness on our own is impossible. It's an impossible task. When you're hopped up on HGTV and you've watched it and you've watched it, but you have no money to do something, we get 
crazy sometimes and we type into the search engines and believe that we can do something. Uh, we want to do it cheap. We want to do it ourselves. And after receiving a quote on your dream kitchen and you look at your budget and you say, well, I don't know. You go to the computer and you Google how to build, paint, install cabinets for beginners or how to quarry, cut, polish granite with hand tools because that's all you have is hand tools. That's all you own. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Uh, what do we think we need to do? What do we think we need to do? One search outside the realm of possibility is how to become holy on my own. How do I become holy? Step one, you can't. Step one, you can't. If you think you're holy, you aren't. You aren't. Um, what does the scripture say? All have sinned, right? All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. This is the state that we're born into. And apart from and outside of a force that acts on us and changes that, it's the state we continue to be in till eventually we die. We, we're in that state. So the question before us this morning as we look at this is, what can possibly be done to make us holy and restore us to God? Which leads us to the second point that I want to make is that God makes our holiness possible. God makes holiness possible. But why? Why? Why would God do this? Why does the holy God, you know, mess around with us? Mess around with sinful people. A holy God and unholy people are like two positively charged uh, magnets. You ever, you ever tried to get them together? You try to push them together and they keep pushing, them, pushing themselves apart all the time. They'll never be united unless God, in his wisdom, finds a way to make people holy. That's exactly what we see in Scripture, and that's exactly what God did. God has what theologian Michael Horton in his systematic theology calls a driving passion to make the whole earth his holy dwelling. He has a driving passion for holiness. And that driving passion results in God, despite being sinned against, continuing to move toward us, continuing to come to us, moving always, uh, not, not away from us, but moving toward us in his holy mercy and holy love toward us. He spends his holy energy to restore an unholy people to himself. That's what God is in the business of doing. And for the sake of time, I want to jump to the ultimate uh, example of it, which is the moment when God himself in the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, left heaven and united himself to us by taking on flesh and becoming fully human while at the same time remaining fully God. How does a holy God pursue an unholy people? He becomes one of them. He, he came into our world. He lived a life that we should have lived died a death that we should have died. So the scripture says holiness is a free gift given by grace and received by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you receive the truth, the first thing that will happen is with regards to holiness is this. God establishes our holiness. God establishes your holiness which means God the Father sets you apart to be holy. That's what, remember, we, we've talked about this the last two weeks. Holiness is being set apart. And he does this by uniting us, putting us in the Lord Jesus Christ, uniting us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Basic theology in the church, right? That's basic theology. We are united in Christ. And when you receive Christ, you are in that moment holy. In that moment, when you receive Christ, you become holy 
in God in the sense that you are set apart for him. You're set apart. You are declared, listen, it's all through scripture. You are declared his people. These are my people. How many times does God say that? That's how the writers of the New Testament can refer to those in the church, the people of God. They are saints, right? You are saints of God, which means you are holy ones. That's what saints means, the holy ones of God. Why can Peter call the church a holy nation? Why can Paul address the first letter to the Corinth and say, to those sanctified, to those who are holy? Same words that are being used. Sanctified comes from the word holy, the root word that's used there, and means to be made holy in Christ. Um, you want to jump up and give me that uh, on, the, on the piano here? I want to sing this while we're thinking about it. It's so sweet. You, you get this by trusting Jesus. Trusting Jesus. And that's what this song says. It is so sweet. He's going to give us the chord. We're just going to sing it. Because I don't want to get too low and I don't want to get too high. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. How do you become holy? It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. It's a simple thing. Believe in Jesus. Trust Trust in the Lord. So this holiness is established in us at conversion where we accept Christ and is based on our uniting ourselves to Jesus Christ by faith. And we become his people. Our union with Christ is all over the New Testament. You know, you can, I'll just give you a couple things real quickly here. Romans 6 says, is that we are made alive in Christ. In Christ. Galatians 2 says, we are justified, made as if we haven't sinned, in Christ. In, 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 in uh, Romans 3, it says, we are redeemed or brought into the presence of God in Christ. We're not condemned in Christ. We're not condemned. We are set free in Christ. Uh, the, in, in Colossians, the very mystery of the gospel is described as Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's always in Christ, right? The whole thing. In Christ, this happens. In Christ, this happens. In Christ, you're part of his glory. It is the solution to the problem that was caused by Adam in the very beginning. He was in union with God. We know the story back in the garden. He lost it by sinning. We are in union with Adam. We're part of Adam's race, destined to sin, destined for death. So God unites himself to us taking on human flesh so that those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ might be united to God once again. It's not that difficult to, to understand, but that's not all. God doesn't just give us and, and leave us to, to defend things or fend for ourselves. God gives us the gospel that saves us and then transforms us. There's more. See more? God increases our holiness. We are made holy, and then God increases our holiness. Holiness encompasses the idea that we have been transformed in your thinking, in your minds, of what's happening in your life. In Romans 12, that famous chapter says, Therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. 
transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew means to replace. And we see this throughout the New Testament as well. So renewing your mind means to replacing the old way of thinking with a new way of thinking. Take off the old, Paul uses this language, put on the new, right? Put on the new. So when you read, we are to renew our minds by the washing of the word, which Jesus says here in the 17th century. Renew your mind by the washing of the word. It means to replace the old way of thinking with what the Bible says. That's what it means. Replace the old way of thinking with what the Bible says. Non-Christians have a certain way of thinking. Uh, Paul calls it the utility of their minds. They are, he says, darkened in their understanding. Now, you don't want to run around and tell people that. Now, that, that, that wouldn't be good for your health. When we become Christians, we still have some old way of thinking. So we're created holy. Positionally, we are holy in God. He set us apart. But there's some things in our lives, there's old ways of thinking that are still with us. So the first step to become holy is to think like a Christian. To think like a Christian. But that can only happen, first of all, if you're in Christ. So that has to happen first. So you're in Christ you can't think like a believer if you're not a believer. So you're in Christ. So as you become a child of God, your thinking begins to change. You know this. You start to think differently. You start to act differently. You, 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 you look at life. There's a, there's a worldview that begins to change. But holiness, all, although it, in, it incorporates right thinking, it also is a process. Holiness is like cleaning a messy house, which I've done lately. Cleaning a messy house. When God saves us, we're set apart as holy, but our lives are a mess. They're, our lives are a mess. We're like a house with toys all over the floor and dishes piled up in the sink with, with the food still on them. We still sin. We still have old patterns in our life that are contrary to our holy position. We need to get cleaned up. It's a process called sanctification, right? Justification is when we come to Christ, made holy, just as if we'd never sinned, and now there's a other process which is called sanctification. Now, we're just working through theology here. This is, this is all of what we've always believed, Right? So Jesus says, if you got your scriptures, in verse 19, he says, for them I sanctify myself. Now this is interesting. For, for them I sanctify myself. Now here's the essence of the word sanctify. In context, it means to separate. Jesus is saying, I separate myself. It's clear that when Jesus says, I sanctify, sanctify myself, he doesn't mean I'm becoming a better person or I'm becoming a more pure person person. Remember what he said at one point? The, the, his enemies come up against him and he said to them, which one of you accuses me of sin? And they were all quiet, right? Which one of you accuses me of, of sin? Jesus was already perfect, so it can't mean to become more perfect. How can Jesus become sanctified? The answer is in the etymology of the word of sanctification it does not mean to get better. It does not mean become a nice person. It means to set yourself apart, to be separated, to be completely committed to something so that all other concerns are set to the side. Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself. What's he saying? He's going to the cross here. He's putting everything aside in his life and saying, this is my purpose. I sanctify myself. That's what that means. I sanctify myself. An example of that, we're, we're watching them over in the Japan. They're going to do the Olympics pretty quick, right? And there's people that are on their way over there. It's kind of a mess right now with everything that's going on. But here's an athlete that's going to the Olympic Games. She wants to win an Olympic gold medal. That's their goal. That's the goal. What does she do? She sanctifies, she sets herself apart, 
she separates herself from a lot of different foods. You know, she's not eating potato chips and french fries all day. You know? She separates herself from a lot of activities and attitudes. Now, none of these foods, none of these activities, none of these attitudes are wrong to somebody else, but they're wrong for her because she's set herself aside. They're wrong for her life. She set herself apart. She is a holy athlete. She's a holy athlete because she has sanctified herself for this cause of winning a gold medal. What does it mean to be a holy person? What has Jesus done? What has Jesus done? He has taken all of his resources, all of his time, everything he has, everything he is, and he says, no longer am I going to use this for any other purpose but this. I have sanctified myself. This is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going. I'm going to the cross. He's committed himself. No compromise. This is his priority. You want a, a, a definition of holiness? I'll give you one from, uh, from Numbers chapter 14. If you go to Numbers chapter 14, I know you all have your Bibles. Where the people of God have been brought to the promised land. They're at the edge of the promised land. You remember this? And they're going to go into the promised land. And God says to them, you go in and you take it. It's yours. Right? We know the story. What do the people say? Can't do that. Impossible. Impossible. There's giants in the land. We'll be, we'll be killed. We'll be slaughtered. We can't go in. Right? And God says, all right. No, remember, remember the line? All right, if you're not going to obey me, I'm telling you to go in. If you're not going to obey me, I'm going to send you back into the wilderness for 40 years, and you're going to die there. And I'm going to give the land to your children. And then he says, except for Caleb and Joshua. And he looks at Caleb. You remember, Caleb was one of the spies that had gone into the land and come back and says, we can do this. We can do this. Let's go take it. Now he's all, go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Now watch. Here's a great definition of holiness. It's in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 24. And I put it up on the screen for you. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me, how? Wholeheartedly, that's holiness, he's, he's committed himself, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. You see how relevant this is? How relevant it is? God says to you, let's go into the land. And he gives you rules. He says, you need to do this, you need to pour out yourself on other people. You need to care for other people. You need to give your time and you need to give your, your money away. You need to tell the truth. You need to, don't, you know what we just prayed about. Pray for your enemies, you know. Never repay evil for evil. Forgive, live sexually pure lives. That's what I require of you. And when you hear God, what do you say? Well, that's, can't do that. It's impossible. I can't do all these things. That's our natural, it's impractical. We'll be slaughtered out there. That's not how people live today. Or maybe you realize, if I'm going to take the land, I'm going to have to sanctify myself. I'm going to have to be holy. I'm going to have to set myself apart. I'm going to have to say there are things that are no longer right for me. They're just no longer right for me in my life. To be holy means to be wholly committed to God. It's a priority thing. It's a priority for your life. It's a way of thinking. You begin to think differently. You're focused on God. There's another, another place. It's in our text, but it's also another place in the Bible. It's in the 19th verse of John 17, where Jesus says, I sanctify myself for them, for their sakes, in Luke 9, 51, it says the same thing. Jesus says, he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem and die. 
he set his face to go and die. He would not take his eyes off it. That's what that means. He would look at nothing else. He set his face to go to the cross. And nothing else mattered. I'll give you an illustration of this. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one that I've, I've used before that I like. The bride is uh, getting married. She's very nervous about the day. And it was her wedding day, so she was confident she wasn't going to be able to do this. She was scared about even walking down the aisle, so she was very, very nervous. So her father gave her some words of wisdom. He says, you know, there's only three things you've got to think about when you walk down that aisle. Three things that you need to focus on, and then you'll be fine. So the first, he says, is walking down the aisle. That's the first thing. That's the first thing you've got to do, walk down the aisle. He says, I know it's long, but don't get caught up with what people are doing on either side. Keep your mind. Just walk down the aisle. Focus on the altar. Secondly, he says, or focus on the aisle. Now, the second thing he says, focus on the altar. Once you get down there, you need to stand before God with the man that you love and say your vows. Focus on the altar. And then the third thing, he says, focus on the hymn. The hymn embodies God's love for you in Christ, your love for your husband and his love for you. Don't be nervous. Focus. So focus on the aisle. Focus on the altar. Focus on the hymn. So the family and friends, they're all there and they're watching this young lady as she walks down the aisle and they saw the really calm look on her face because she was, she was getting into this now. So as she passed them, the people on both sides began to chuckle. And, and uh, she was mumbling three words over and over and over again. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. <laughs> I'll alter him. Focus. That's the same thing it's saying in Luke 9, 51. And in John, said, Jesus said and looks at one thing. He looks at one thing. Now, I play golf every so often, and uh, once a year or once every 10 years. If that, it's fun. I like to do it. I haven't done it in some time, but I have a bad habit. And those of you, I know there's golfers out here. Just before I bring the club up, I'm swinging the club, I turn my head and I swing and I, I'm looking at there instead of looking down at the uh, tee. And anyone that knows anything about golf knows that's a no-no. That's a cardinal rule. You don't do that when you're playing golf. Now, the reason I do it is, uh, you see, I want to know where the ball goes, right? Where's that ball going? Because it never goes where I want it to go. So I want to know where, does it go in the sand trap? Is it going to the lake? Is it going to the trees, mud? Where is it going? Because i got to go find it after I hit it. So I'm going, to, I'm going to have to find that ball. So I want to know it. Last time I golfed was with Jeff Crockett. So how many years ago was that, Jeff? It was a while. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Jeff, uh, of course, noticed that. And I don't know if he remembers this, but he says, keep your face, on the, keep your face down. Keep looking at the tee when you're looking at the ball. He said, I'll watch the ball. That's what he said. I'll watch the ball. Don't look up. Don't get distracted. Laser focus. I'll alter him. Stay focused on things. You see, the, the Bible says, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. And up in verses 11 and 12, it says, Holy Father, protect him by the power of your name. That's the first thing. By the power of your name. Holiness comes from fixing your face on the name of God. Who God is. Who is he? Holiness comes on the truth of God. And focusing on the truth of God. It means to gaze at it and nothing else. Laser focus on that. What is God saying to you in his word? Be controlled by it. Be controlled by who God is. And as you fix your mind on Christ, Christ-like characteristics begin to grow in your life. And you become more and more. When you are sanctified by truth, you look and you begin to act like Jesus. You act like Jesus. 
with your life. Look at the cross, and Jesus is going to that cross, and follow him. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Jesus sanctifies himself on the cross. Now watch this. Even as he's hanging there dying, look, look at him on the cross. What, what is he doing? They're mocking him. I mean, they're just they're spitting on him. They've, they've taken to, he's naked up there. They've taken his clothes off. They've humiliated him. They're, 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 they're stabbing him. They're, they're, I mean, just hideous. His life is slipping away. King, come down. If you're the king, come on down. Come on down. What does he do? He looks up. He focuses on the Father. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. Look at that. He focuses on his purpose. He focuses on the Father. One eternal purpose. Father, they mean well. Father, they don't get it. Forgive them. I know they're, cruci I know they're crucifying me. I know that they're killing me. But they don't understand that redemption is happening. They don't understand that I'm saving them. Fix your face on that. And the last thing, and I like this, there's coming a day when we will be wholly renovated by God. One theologian put it this way, God consummates our holiness. God consummates our holiness. In verse 6 in your scripture and in verse 11 and throughout this prayer, have you noticed how often we are referred to by Jesus as Mine, they're mine. I mean, again and again, he said, they're mine. They are mine. You know, he says in verse 6, they were yours, now they're mine. They're mine. If you go to Exodus 19, God says to the people of Israel, and I, and I remember a sermon years ago that I did where I just went through the Old Testament. It says, you are my people, you are my people. You are, I mean, it, took, it, it, it would take us all morning. How many times he says that? You are my people. You're mine. You're my people. You're my people. Again and again. Old Testament, New Testament. It's over and over and over again. You are my people. You are my people. My own people. It says in Exodus 19, God says to the people of Israel, you saw what I did in Egypt, how I brought you out with eagle's wings to myself, so you would be my treasure, my treasured possession, a holy nation my own people. Now, I want you to watch something where I'm going here, because this is so relevant for today. People say, well, the Bible's not relevant. Well, yes, it is. It's unbelievably relevant today. Just so nobody thinks that was only true in the Old Testament or Old Testament people. The New Testament says the same thing. People, Peter says about the church, but you are a chosen people, right? A holy nation, God's own people belonging to God. Now, what does it mean to be holy? Literally. Now, watch me, what I'm going to do here. You belong to God. You belong to God. You are God's people today. You are God. You've, you've accepted Christ. You're a child of God. Now, do you know what it literally says? It's in 1 Peter. Now, you, you, ought, to, you ought to underline this and you ought to mark it. So if you, you write it down, you need to take it home and mark it. This is important. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Now listen to this. You're God's people. 1 Peter 2 9 says literally that you are a holy nation. Now watch this. You know what that means? You know what that, that word is in the Greek? And you, and you don't know, I know you don't know this. It means you are a holy ethnic. Ethnic, that's the word. You are a holy ethnic. Why would God say to Christians, you are a new holy ethnic? Why does holiness turn you into a new ethnic? Here's why. Now listen to me. Listen to me. What's the difference between an ethnic group and an organization? To be a member of the Girl Scouts, let's say. 
or the Rotary Club is not the same thing as being a member of the Brazilian ethnic group. It's not the same thing as being a member of the African ethnic group. Here's why. An ethnic group is a culture. It's a culture. If you're a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, that means a couple of places in your life have to change. But if you're an African as opposed to a Hispanic, as opposed to an Asian, it's a different culture. It's a different culture. A whole different way of doing things. Now, I have a daughter-in-law, uh, married and have grandchildren. She came from Zambia. When she came over, she has a different way of doing things, of how she thinks and from their culture and the things that they do. I'm very aware of this. Of, of the, her trying to fit into different things here in this country. Your ethnicity determines how you relate to people and other races. Now think about this today. It determines economic relations, how families work, how the children are raised, what you think good music is, even your sense of humor. And what you think, you can go over to England and say something they don't, they don't think it's funny. And you're, you're just, you're rolling, rolling around laughing. And they, what, what's he laughing? They, they don't get it, you know. To be this ethnic as opposed to that ethnic, it's a difference. It's a total difference. What God is saying here is pretty amazing. Watch me. What, if you're wholly committed to me, and wholly focus on me. It will change every area of your life. Every area of your life. You say, what? My work, my, my humor, my child rearing, my, my attitude toward people, other races, my business, every area of your life. If you're focused on Christ, will be changed. It will be changed. See, when the Bible, now watch, when the Bible says in Christ there is no Jew and there is no Greek, it doesn't mean suddenly the, the, the Greek Christian is going to be like the Jewish Christian music. But you know what it does mean? Here's what it means. It means the Greek Christian and the Jewish Christian will become so fundamentally changed in their ethnicity, in every area of their life, as they focus on God, focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Greek Christian will find that he or she has more in common with the Jewish Christian than with the Greek non-Christian. That's true. I have more in common with you folks than I do some people in my own family. That's true. That's a true statement. Uh, bit by bit by bit by bit. Bit by bit by bit. We will find that we are so changed in every area of our life that we find you're a Christian first. Listen to me. You're a Christian first and you're an American second. You're a Christian first. Everything's going to, listen, everything in this world is going to change. All these nations that we have, they're all going to be gone. In the twinkling of an eye, Scripture says, and there's going to be one nation, one people, standing before God, a holy nation. And all this other stuff is going to be gone. It's going to be passe. You're not of this world. That's what it says. Jesus says, they are not of this world like I am. You are not of this world. If you get that, if you let that sink into your brain and your mind, everything will change how you look at things. You are not of this world. John 17, 16 is where it says that. You believe that is a game changer. It, it's a game changer. You're a Christian first. You're not black first. You're not white first. 
You're a Christian first. You're not labor first or management first. You're a Christian first. You're a member of this family. You're a member of the family of God. And it's not this family, that family. It's God's family. You're a member of God's family. And the problem with the church today is we think we're the same as everybody else. We are not. We are not the same. We've been bought with a price. And we're part of God's people. And we're part of God's name. Every area of our life will be changed because we are forging a new humanity. Do we get that? It's a new, it's a new nation. It's a new humanity. We're in Christ. In 1 Peter 2.9 it says, but you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How do you get the world to come and say, say your, your God's a great God? How do you get the world to say that? By the holiness of your practice. By following Jesus. You're a new ethnic. Do we get it? You're a new, you are a new people. We're forging a new humanity. It's not a club. It's a new humanity. It's a holy nation. And you've called to be a holy people. To be the special treasure is what he calls in scripture. Mine. He says, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. How many times has he says that? You're mine. Now here, let's, let's, let's just mention this. Just, just, just frankly. Do you know what it means to be a holy people? It's just real simple. You've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. So step five. How do you become holy? Is that God consummates your holiness. Now watch where this goes in scripture. And what he says here. Which is a way of saying there's a day coming. People of God. There's a day coming. There's a kingdom coming when sin will have no control over us, no sway over our hearts. Scripture confirms this to us in a number of places. L listen to this from, from uh, Hebrews 12, 23. Good passage of Scripture that speaks to this. God's holy city, the New Jerusalem in heaven, God's holy city is described in Hebrews 12, 23, it says, in that city, now listen to what it says, the spirits of the righteous are made perfect. The spirits of the righteous are made perfect. In Revelation 21, 27, we read, nothing unclean will ever enter it. The spirits of the righteous are made perfect. Nothing unclean will enter that city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are guaranteed to be made perfect, consummated. You're in process. You will be made perfect when you enter into heaven. Think about that. Philippians 1.6 says that we read, and I am sure of this, you know the passage, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of the Lord Jesus. Romans 8, 29 says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's where we're going. 1 Corinthians 15 says, and we hear, just as we have been born in the image of the man of the dust, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. And it's speaking of the day of the bodily resurrection where we're resurrected to be like him. So, so, to answer our question this morning, how do we become holy? We answer it by saying, we can't. We can't. But God can make us holy. First, he establishes us at conversion as holy, setting us apart as holy. Then he increases our holiness through sanctification. His spirit meets us, enables us to grow in holiness. And then finally, one day, he's going to consummate our holiness, bringing us to perfection. That's, that's biblical theology. 
when he brings us into the presence of heaven, every other difference is petty. Every other difference is petty. We're all children of God. That's how we become holy. It's not a do-it-yourself project. God made it possible. God began it. God is carrying it out, and God will complete it. Let's pray together. So, Father, we are thankful as we, we, we look at this passage of Scripture. And what powerful words that are here. These are, these are my people. Father, watch over them. Make them holy. I sanctify myself. I need them to sanctify themselves. Set them apart. So, Father, we pray for that in our own lives. That as we think about life, that it's not we're different. We're different people. The scripture calls us a peculiar people. We're not like everybody else. We're followers of the Lamb. And we decided to follow Jesus with our life. So as we follow you, Lord, give us the strength through your Holy Spirit to be what you've called us to be, to act the way you've called us to act, to reach out to other people with humility and with love, to pray for our enemies, to care for others, to, to think differently, to watch our actions, how we think, what we do, where we go. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't do what other people do. We're careful. So help us, our Father, in, in that act of holiness or as we minister to people around us, that we have respect, that we have honor, that we act with some dignity about who we are in Christ, that we act with love. Yes, we are to love the people of the world, care for them, go beyond what we normally would do to show the love of Christ, that we are a holy nation. We are an ethnic. We are God's people. This is our heart, Lord, as we look at this this morning. We ask you to, to apply that to who we are uh, each day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.